Hey all, welcome back to the Real Life Pharmacology Podcast. I'm your host, pharmacist Eric Christensen. Thank you so much for listening today. Uh, as always, go check out reallifepharmacology.com. Uh, grab your free 31-page PDF on the top 200 drugs. Great little study guide, uh, refresher for board exams, or if you're just looking to get up to speed with practice, uh, or if you're in school taking pharmacology exams, finals, things like that. Um, good little refresher with, with lots of uh, real-life uh, pearls and, and things that matter uh, with each of the top 200 drugs there. So again, reallifepharmacology.com, uh, go snag that free PDF. All right, so let's get into the drug today, and uh, it's not really a drug, I guess. It's more of a, a supplement, uh, and that is folic acid. Um, but it definitely plays a role in medication therapy, particularly when we use specific drugs, uh, which I'll discuss. It, it definitely plays a, a role there for sure. Uh, a little bit about folic acid, um, water-soluble uh, vitamin, uh, so Typically, accumulation isn't a, a big deal in most situations. Um, compare that to some of the fat-soluble vitamins where excessive supplementation um, could potentially uh, lead to, to more accumulation there. Um, mechanistically, uh, folic acid plays a role in uh, forming coenzymes and, and metabolic reactions and, and processes, uh, DNA production, uh, and red blood cell production, which, you know, folic acid, if you're looking at deficiencies in, in clinical practice, um, one of the most important things that we're going to look out for is potentially anemia. And again, that goes back to, you know, folic acid being important uh, with red blood cell production. Uh, other uses, uh, prevention of, of neural tube defects in females of, of childbearing age. So that's certainly a use and a reason for supplementation that I've seen actually in, in clinical practice. Uh, certain medications, I'll get into that a, a little bit. Um, just a couple off the top of my head, methotrexate, uh, folic acid supplementation is always recommended with, with that medication or typically recommended. Uh, phenytoin. Um, can cause some gingival hyperplasia, and folic acid supplementation can help uh, potentially reduce the risk of, of that adverse effect. Uh, going back to kind of methotrexate, remember methotrexate uh, is technically classified uh, as an agent that's used uh, as an oncology agent as well as a medication used uh, in the management of autoimmune diseases like rheumatoid arthritis, for example. Uh, it's it's an anti uh, metabolite and it uh, ultimately uh, reduces uh, folate within the intracellular folate within the the body there. Uh, other situations where you might see folic acid supplementation, uh, alcoholic patients, um, you often see a vitamin cocktail there of uh, B12 and thiamine and and potentially things like magnesium. Again, kind of depends upon. Uh, what issues that patient is having, and obviously uh, how severe the alcohol use disorder is. Uh, and then potentially issues with uh, GI absorption. So, you know, bariatric surgery, you know, certain types of uh, gastrointestinal diseases where malabsorption may play a role. Uh, that's another situation where you might see uh, folic acid supplemented. Uh, adverse drug reactions. Uh, you know, typically the the dosing you're going to see is is one to to five milligrams. Um, Ninety five to one hundred percent of the time, you know, in, in patients taking, um, you know, folic acid, let's say for for methotrexate uh, purposes, um, the most often dose I've seen is one milligram. Uh, adverse drug reactions, you know potentially could go up or the risk for them could go up as you increase that dose. Uh, but overall, in general, I see very, very few issues with kind of your standard uh, supplementation of, of folic acid. So uh, things to, to keep in mind, you know, flushing, hypersensitivity, again, extremely, extremely rare um, that they're going to cause any significant issues, uh, but just a, a couple that I'll, I'll throw out there. Uh, I mentioned, kind of alluded to that dosing a, a little bit for supplementation. And again, one milligram is definitely the, the dose I see most often. 
um, when using for, you know, kind of just general supplementation purposes. Um, with uh, folic acid, obviously, it's it's found in, in food, and we get it through our, our diet, and the recommended uh, dietary allowance or, or intake is 200 micrograms per day. So again, that's about 0.2 uh, milligrams where the supplement uh, typically at one milligram is is going to be five times uh, the recommended dietary allowance there. So that just gives you a little ballpark on uh, dosing, uh, dietary intake versus uh, supplementation because most people, if they don't have a reason to take folic acid and they're eating a relatively normal diet, um, certainly aren't going to need folic acid in, in most situations. Um, drug levels, I did want to mention, uh, specifically or, or serum levels, I should say, um, not, not necessarily, uh, drug levels, but, uh, so serum levels, um, ballpark range two to 20 is kind of what, what I remember from most labs. Um, you, you know, I have seen a little bit higher, like three to 18 or, or, you know, two to 16, a little lower upper end. So that can kind of range a little bit based upon the, the lab you're, you're looking at. So, um, yeah, it's important when we're looking at those those blood levels to understand uh, the lab it's coming from too, but that kind of gives you a, a ballpark. So, again, probably in that 2 to 20 uh, nanograms per mil, that's the, the most common normal level uh, that I, I see there. Uh, megaloblastic anemia, I did want to mention um Folic acid deficiency certainly can cause this, uh, but it's also really, really important that B12 deficiency is assessed as well in patients with uh, megaloblastic anemia. This is, again, patients with a higher uh, mean corpuscular volume or MCV, uh, that may be indicative of a folate or B12 deficiency uh, causing anemia. So really, really important. Um, uh, to assess B12 along with uh, folate deficiency in, in dealing with our patients uh, with anemia there. All right, let's take a quick break from our sponsor and we'll wrap up with drug interactions. If you're in the market for pharmacist board certification study material like pharmacotherapy exam, geriatrics exam, ambulatory care, MTM, uh, the NAPLEX exam, definitely go check out all our resources at meded101.com store. Uh, in addition, if you're another healthcare professional, we've got books on uh, drug interactions, case studies, uh, drug food interactions, uh, lots of unique resources that can really help round out uh, your education as a, a clinician and or a fellow healthcare professional. So again, support there helps keep this uh, podcast free. Uh, so again, all the links there you can find uh, meded101.com slash store, S-T-O-R-E. All right, so wrapping up with drug interactions as we usually do here. Um, I'm, when whenever I see folic acid or whenever I see some of these medications, I think about the potential need to supplement folic acid. So here's a, a few medications that I've definitely come across that could potentially lead to folic acid deficiency. So phenytoin, we kind of mentioned before, definitely keep an eye out for that one. Uh, methotrexate, definitely mentioned that before. Uh, some other unique ones, uh, trimethoprim, again used for UTIs, sometimes UTI prophylaxis. And trimethoprim is probably not one I'm going to worry about if we're giving a 5 or 10 day course uh, you know, in the, the management of a UTI. Um, definitely not something I'm probably going to worry about in the long term, folic acid deficiency. Um, but if you've got somebody on uh, UTI prophylaxis or, you know, prophylaxis for another purpose, um, some of the, the HIV uh, conditions and, and uh, opportunistic infections can be managed with sulfamethoxazole slash trimethoprim. So again, if you see this medication on board chronically, uh, definitely might be a good idea to, to take a look at that uh, folic acid level uh, and make sure we're not getting deficient there. Uh, sulfasalazine, uh, another drug potentially used in uh, GI disorders, potentially used in autoimmune disorders like rheumatoid arthritis. Um, so that's another one to, to kind of think about there. Um, triamterine, 
So this is a potassium sparing diuretic, has had some associations uh, with folic acid deficiency. And of course, if you, th if you know your patient is a heavy alcohol user, um, that certainly can lend towards the uh, risk of, of folic acid deficiency. Uh, as far as you know, folic acid causing a bunch of drug interactions and impacting other medications, uh, I, I really don't think of it too much as, as doing that. Uh, I think of other meds causing folic acid deficiency more so. Uh, however, there is you know some th theoretical risks uh, in that folic acid uh, could lower phenytoin concentrations, phenobarbital concentrations, um, so again, it's, it's something that, you know, if you have a patient um, with chronic seizures, uh, they're pretty stable, things like that, um, and they've been on folic acid for forever, and we've had folic, and we've had levels since that folic acid has been on board, probably not something I'm, I'm going to really worry about strongly. Now, if you're starting folic acid in a patient that's, you know, taking phenytoin, for example, that might not be a, a bad idea to get you know, uh, potentially another, you know, free level or, or whatever levels you're monitoring um, and, you know, keep tabs and, and make sure that uh, we're not increasing the risk of seizures there. Again, not an incredibly strong um, interaction by any means, at least in, in my opinion, um, but it is something to think about in a, in a patient that's maybe had very sensitive levels and or um, had risks with, you know, phenytoin adjustments in the past or uh, at increased risk uh, for seizure for some reason there. So, again, I don't place a ton of stock in it, um, but it is something to uh, think about as we're uh, guiding or, or changing medication therapy. All right, well, I think that's going to wrap up the podcast for today. I hope you enjoyed this episode, picked up a few practice pearls. Uh, definitely leave a rating review on iTunes if you haven't done so. I'm greatly appreciative to those of you who have done that already. Uh, also, share us with a friend, colleague, uh, student group, uh, whoever might benefit uh, from some more pharmacology education. Uh, go check out reallifepharmacology.com, snag that free PDF. Also, uh, definitely support the sponsor, meded101.com slash store. I'm going to sign off for today. Thank you all for listening, and I hope you have a great rest of your day.